Have we started? Yes, the webinar is now broadcasting. Okay, well, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Alliance for Global Justice entitled Uncovered Violence by the Nicaraguan Opposition. We have a great panel of speakers lined up and we look forward to your participation during the question and answer period. The webinar title has a double meaning. We believe that much of the violence perpetrated by the opposition in Nicaragua has not been covered by the mainstream media and human rights organizations. And second, that this violence is being revealed in greater detail today through the investigation and, and writing of our panelists. My name is Barbara Larkham, and I'll serve as your moderator today. Uh, before we begin, I'll make some brief announcements. To stay up to date with events and, and issues in Nicaragua, you can sign up for NICA Notes, which includes a weekly article by an invited art author, followed by news updates of the week. You can sign up at the Alliance for Global Justice website, afgj.org. Also, two ebooks are available free in English and Spanish, downloadable in several formats. These were collectively written by a network of activists, including all four of us before you this afternoon. Uh, the first of these was written last year, and it's entitled Live from Nicaragua, Uprising or Coup. This ebook describes and analyzes the violent attempted overthrow of the Sandinista government in 2018 and the events surrounding it. The second ebook, which was finished a few months ago, is entitled the revolution won't be stopped, colon, Nicaragua advances despite U.S. unconventional warfare. This ebook describes the events which took place in 2019, as well as the early months of 2020, when the Nicaraguan government began to address the COVID-19 pandemic. Just go to the same Alliance for Global Justice website, afgj.org, to download these ebooks. Uh, this webinar is intended to be part of a series usually occurring about once a month. Please mark your calendars for the next webinar in the series, which will take place on Sunday, December 6th, at the same time as today. The topic will be U.S. unconventional warfare using human rights agencies. The speakers will be Camilo Mejia and John Perry. The format for today's webinar is as follows. Nan McCurdy will cover some of the important news items related to Nicaragua since our last webinar a month ago. She will have about nine minutes. Then each of the other two speakers will have 15 minutes for their presentations. After that, we'll have a brief period of about five minutes for the four of us to make any brief comments or questions of one another. If we follow this schedule carefully, we should have at least 20 minutes left for a question and answer by the audience after that. Uh, one other note to the audience is you can put your comments in the chat, but please make sure that you put any questions intended for the panelists in the Q&A uh, portion. I'm going to be pulling those questions to address to the panelists, and I may not see them promptly unless, unless they are in the Q&A. Okay, uh, to des describe myself briefly, I'm Barbara Larkham, and I've been involved in Nicaragua work since 1985. I coordinate the U.S.-based portion of Casa Baltimore Limay, which is a Friendship City project linking Baltimore, Maryland with San Juan de Limay, Nicaragua. And a special note, a uh, point of personal privilege, if you, if you will, if you've been involved with Casa Baltimore Limay or San Juan de Limay at any point in the last 35 years, please mark your calendars for Sunday, November 15th. We're holding our anniversary celebration on that date at 3.30 p.m. Eastern or 2.30 p.m. Nicaraguan time. Uh, please write a note to me in the chat if you'd like to get more information about that. And now to introduce our speakers. Uh, Nan McCurry is the editor of the online weekly, Nika Notes. She, she is a United Methodist missionary working in development in the countryside of Mexico now. She lived in Nicaragua for over 30 years and she recently spent six months there experiencing firsthand how the public health system handled the pandemic. 
John Perry has lived and worked in Messiah, Nicaragua for the past 17 years. He personally observed much of the violence which occurred in 2018, which was especially badly felt in Messiah. He works voluntarily with a small local NGO that promotes sustainable farming methods on small farms in Messiah area, including working with them to build solar lighting in isolated rural areas. The NGO is supported by the Leicester Messiah Link Group based in Leicester, United Kingdom. John writes about Nicaragua and Honduras. He's been published in The Nation, London Review of Books, Counterpunch, Council for Hem Hemispheric Affairs, COHA, The Gray Zone, Open Democracy, and elsewhere. Stephen Sefton has worked on Central American human rights and solidarity matters since 1986. He lived and worked in Nicaragua and Honduras for a total of four years from 1986 until 1994, when he moved to Nicaragua permanently. Currently, he assists community education and preventive health programs in Esteli. He's coordinated the Tortilla Consal, a media collective since 2008. Today, Stephen will present results from 23 new interviews with 30 victims of opposition violence in central Nicaragua. So now let's begin by welcoming Nan McCurdy. Hi everyone, thanks so much for being with us. So I'm gonna share a few news items from the last six weeks. 58% of the 2021 budget will go for social spending, 21% for health and 25 for education. Subsidies will continue for transportation, electricity and water. For vulnerable sectors. Exports as of September 30th again broke records, reaching more than $2 billion, an increase of 17% over the same period last year, according to the Export Processing Center and recognized by the Economic Commission for Latin America. The World Bank readjusted their economic growth protect projections for Latin America highlighting that Nicaragua has been the only country to increase its exports in this period and not paralyze its economy. September 1st, Forbes magazine recognized Nicaragua as having the best COVID-19 recovery rate in the region. And according to the World Health Organization, it has the lowest mortality rate in Central America. On September 7th, an Inter-American Development Bank report placed Nicaragua among the Latin American countries with the least difficulty accessing drinking water and with a good scenario for the next 20 years. The most recent World Bank report places Nicaragua among the countries where children have the highest probability of survival to age five above 98%. The World Bank recognizes Nicaragua's pro-children policies, like the school meal program and the nu nutritional census. On October 7th, Dante Mossi, president of the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, highlighted Nicaragua's performance in project execution. He noted, the quality planning Dynam dynamism and effectiveness of Nicaragua's project management is excellent, and the finance ministry is extremely organized and transparent, allowing CABE to plan projects in an easy manner and without concerns. The Central America Bank for Economic Integration announced September 21st that the project to improve and expand the drinking water supply and sanitation systems in Nicaragua has advanced by 96% in 19 cities, reducing disease, strengthening business, and favoring health centers and schools. The government has grown the paved road network by 600% in the last 12 years. From 2006 to 2019, 
4,500 kilometers of new paved roads were built and 1,400 kilometers of deteriorated roads were rebuilt. Nicaragua has the best roads in Central America. The second highway connecting the Pacific coast with the Southern Caribbean, the El Rama San Ramon Highway was inaugurated October 8th, completing the connection between Rama, Kukra Hill and Pearl Lagoon, 86 kilometers long. 457,000 families received property titles since 2007. Under President Chamorro, only 109,000 properties were legalized. Under Aleman, 56,000. And under Bolaño, 16,000. On October 15th, the National Assembly approved the Foreign Agents Regulation Law that creates a legal regulatory framework for persons representing foreign governments or agencies. Deputy Walmaro Gutierrez said all nations have the fundamental right to guarantee their sovereignty. The law is merely to prevent foreign interference. Organizations that have a legal mission have no reason to fear. Many other countries have much more stringent laws than this one, including the United States, Costa Rica, and El Salvador. On October 6th at the United Nations, China demanded the immediate end of, of U.S. sanctions against Nicaragua. The Beijing UN representative regretted that Washington is resorting to punishment at a time when it is necessary to open the way to solidarity, pardon me, I'm having trouble, to solidarity and cooperation in the world. Sanctions prevent progress towards development and the well-being of people, especially children, women, the elderly, and people with disabilities. The last news relates to the topic that Stephen and John will cover. A group of peasants from Nueva Guinea accused Medardo Mairena of not being accountable for foreign money he received and of asking for money to carry out projects that never reached the communities. Mairena was convicted in 2018 of being responsible for the massacre of a school teacher and four police. He received amnesty in June of 2019. Thanks, back to you. And now we will hear from John Perry. Please welcome John Perry. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope um, in a few seconds you can see my slides. Um, thanks for, for that, Barbara, and thanks, Nan. Um, there we go. I'm going to, in a sense, introduce uh, some of the um, material that Stephen is going to be talking about in more detail. Uh, we've got a, an unpleasant topic, which is violence in Nicaragua two years ago and who, caught, co who caused it. And I'm sure most of you know quite a bit about what happened then, but just to quickly recap, the, the, protests, the protests in, in Nicaragua began in April 2018 ostensibly against changes in secu social security law. Um, they were very much orchestrated by opposition groups who were financed by the US, but the students were at the front of the protests and they were the kind of face of the protest. The, the protests led to many deaths, I'll talk about that in a moment, and it led to kidnappings, torturing and disappearances. Many, many public buildings and private houses were, were, pulled, were, were burnt down. In the photographs you can see in the top corner uh, the Granada town hall that was burned down and in the middle Radio Ya, the Sandinista radio station that was burned down. I'm going to talk about both of those. So there was a whole range of attacks against Sandinistas. Of course the police did fight back against the protesters. Um, 
The protesters began to block highways and through much of May and June and into July of 2018, most of Nicaragua was pa paralyzed by roadblocks. All of this was blamed on the government or its supporters. And why was that the case? Well, we had a series of local journalists who they call themselves journalists, but they're really propagandists for the opposition. This is one of them, Lucia Pineda. She portrayed the burning of the, the Granada Town Hall as an act by Sandinistas. So supposedly Sandinistas burned down their own town hall. And this was picked up by international media, of course. And there were many, many uh, journalists, so-called journalists of this kind who were doing this sort of thing. And they've since been recognized internationally by journalist organizations, here by the vice president of the US. There's Lucy, Lucia Pineda with a photograph of the town hall burning that she was describing inaccurately. And Miguel Mora, who promoted the burning down of his rival radio station, Radio Ya, by saying that his radio station, 100% Noticias, was under attack. It wasn't under attack. So we had this, this series of campaigns of fake, fake news and outright lies, um, including the numbers of people and the kinds of people who were being killed in the protests. The official death toll from the protests is 253, of which just 31 are known supporters of the opposition, 48 are known Sandinista supporters, 22 were police, like the poor guy in the photograph there, and 150 or so were bystanders. Now, these figures have never been challenged in detail, even though they are the subject of a detailed analysis, which is publicly available. Human rights bodies put the figure at 328, some put it at even higher, and they all talk about students and protesters being the majority of those killed. A group of us did a, an investigation last year in response to the second report which Amnesty International did about the violence. And we looked at the violence that occurred in central Nicaragua, which is the, fo the focus of today's discussion. Um, and in central Nicaragua, we looked at, uh, Mark Mayer in the United States looked at all of the deaths that had been recorded and analyzed each one. He found that there were more than 30 deaths being reported as related to the conflict, but only 16 were. And practically all of these were either Sandinistas or deaths that were caused by the opposition. These included the deaths in a place called Morito, which which more in a moment. The, the roadblocks in, in central, in, in, in Nicaragua as a whole, and particularly in central Nicaragua, were organized by the Campesino movement. And one of the key leaders was Francisca Ramirez, categorized by Amnesty International as a voice for human rights in Nicaragua. And as we'll show, she was responsible for, the, for much of the violence, indirectly by controlling the, the, the roadblocks that occurred. And we're going to focus on those roadblocks and that, that area with the red ring around it on the map in central Nicaragua. But Francisco Ramirez has been a hero or a heroine of the human rights bodies for quite a few years. Amnesty International, perhaps uh, prophetically said of her in 2016, Francisco will not let anything stop her from defending her rights uh, rather than the rights of campesinos. Um, and she reappeared in 2017 um, in the annual report of Global Witness, where she appeared as a defender of the rainforest, even though, as Stephen will say, she herself owns a large farm, which no doubt was originally rainforest. Um, and she was claiming that uh, Nicaragua was the most dangerous country in the world for human rights protesters. And that was one of the leading headlines from the Global Witness report. And here she is. Um, in a protest of, after the death of a genuine human rights defender, Beta Caceres from Honduras. Um, and in, in those years before 2018, she received a number of uh, uh, laudatory mentions internationally. She was voted by Forbes Mexico as one of the most influential people, women in Central America. Um, she received protective measures from the Inter-American Human Rights Commission because the uh, supposedly she was being persecu persecuted by the Sandinista government. She received a prize from the Czech NGO, People in Need. And then, in, in, then she was uh, filmed with Bianca Jagger launching, launching a, uh, an Amnesty International 
campaign in Managua in 2017. And finally, um, she's even been turned into a pot. This is um, an organization called Peace Post, which has these postings about peacemakers from around the world, which one is supposedly Francisco Ramirez, and she's been um, portrayed here as a pot. So we have two characters that we're talking about today or in the background of everything we're talking about today. One is Francisco Ramirez, and the second I'll come on to now is Medardo Mairena, both considered to be human rights defenders. Or are they that, or were they the key organizers of some of the violence in Nicaragua in 2018? Well, I want to move on in talking to talking about Medardo Mairena to focus on the little town of Morito, a very apparently peaceful place. But I want to talk about the attack that took place on the police station and town hall there on July the 12th, 2018, which was one of the worst attacks of the whole period of violence in 2018. Morito is there, the red blob on the map, as you can see, was surrounded by and blocked off by road by the uh, roadblocks that Francisco Ramirez and Medardo Mirena were controlling. So it was only accessible from the lake. And what happened that day was that there was supposed to be a peaceful protest. It had been advertised as a peaceful protest. A caravan of vehicles came into the town. It was allowed by the opposition to pass its roadblocks, of course, because it was an opposition motor caravan um, at about 2.30 p.m. There were about 200 people who had weapons hidden inside their vehicles. And as they came to the police station, one of them shouted out, today's the day you sons of whores will all die, handing your weapons. They began to fire at the police. Four police were immediately killed. Um, and they also fired at the town hall where a school teacher uh, was killed. After this uh, massacre, not the nine remaining police officers who were in the police station were all kidnapped and taken away. They were beaten up uh, and eventually, much later that day, they were uh, set free only because one of the protesters had later been caught by the police. So in a prisoner exchange, they managed to get the freedom of those, those nine police officers. Um, and the very next day, Medardo Mirena and his colleague Pedro Mena were arrested at Managua Airport as they tried to leave the country. Francisco Ramirez immediately after the event said that the protesters were attacked by agents and paramilitaries acting on behalf of the government and that they responded with gunfire because some of them happened to have vehicles uh, or weapons in their vehicles. Then began the campaign to portray this horrendous event as actually an attack of the police on the protesters, which was absurd. So here's a supposed victim of the police in Morito, um, which actually turns out to be a photograph from an entirely different place. Um, the police, according to um, El Nuevo Diario, had blocked access to the city and fired to disperse the protesters. In fact, it was the other way around. It was the protesters who blocked access to the city and fired at the police. And here's the real origin of this photo. This really comes from an NBC news page. You can still see it there uh, from several years earlier. And it was a poor guy who was killed in Honduras in a protest against the, the coup there when Manuel Zelaya was deposed by, um, uh, the, uh, by the army in Honduras. It had nothing at all to do with Morito. Nevertheless, of course, the usual crew, crew of people started to protest against the violence, insinuating that it was the government that had, that had provoked it. Paula Brau, the um, head of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, uh, posted a tweet immediately afterwards. So did Silvio Baez, the uh, bishop who's most closely aligned with the opposition side. And when Medardo Moreno on the left and Pedro Mena on the right were arrested and then brought to trial. Uh, they were arrested the following day. This immediately became a new subject of protest as if there wasn't substantial evidence against these people. And of course there was. The Sandinista government had got two spies planted amongst the um, opposition roadblocks who were able to testify against these two. And when they were caught at the airport, they had their WhatsApp mes messages still on their phones, showing the images of the violence and even a message saying, 
uh, be careful what you write. If this comes out, there'll be more problems than you can imagine. It's best to say that the police attacked, they fired at the town hall and shots were exchanged between them. Never speak about our people. All of us are victims, even if we shat on them. And so this and a load more WhatsApp messages prov provided ample evidence of, their, of the fact that uh, Mirena and Mena were the two coordinators of the attack, even though they weren't in Morito at the time. In fact, I think they were both in Manawa. But of course, they, they then became human rights defenders. So uh, Senid and the other Nicaraguan-based human rights bodies immediately started to protest against Mirena's arrest, um, that he was um, uh, illegitimately arrested. And of course, they protested against the trial when it took place. And he, so instead of condemning the event, they condemned the um, arrest of the person who was responsible for the event of the atrocity in Morito. And not one of the organizations, either local or international, or any of the media investigated the real event to see whether it was in fact Mirena who was responsible, or if not him, who was. The, the BBC said that a Nicaraguan activist had been sentenced to more than 200 years. Um, the government said the police station in Morito had been attacked by protesters during a march demanding the President Ortega step down, but demonstrators said they'd been shot at as they marched past and only then returned fire. This was in February, um, six months later, when the BBC might have investigated the actual events. And in fact, in June 2019, both Mirena and Pedro Mena were freed under the amnesty. Um, and this, of course, uh, was, was never reported by the BBC. The only serious reporting that's been done by a journalist is by the couple Dick and Miriam in Manwilson. And there's an excellent video on uh, YouTube, which you can see with interviews of people from Morito. And indeed, there are investigations of other places too. Apart, of course, from Stephen's work, which we'll hear about in a moment. In Amnesty's report in October uh, 2018, they reviewed the period of violence in Nicaragua from June to August. They made no mention of Morito. The word Morito doesn't appear in that report. Nevertheless, they found space to condemn the arrests of Mirena and of Pedro Mena as arbitrary detention, even though there was ample proof of their involvement in the violence. So we, here we have Mirena portrayed as a human rights defender and as a victim. This, this is a page of a body called Frontline Defenders, which is based in the Republic of Ireland. And indeed, you can send messages of solidarity to Medardo Mirena through, through that website, as if he's still in prison, which he isn't. And this is where he is. This last, this last weekend, the previous weekend, he was here in uh, Masaya. He's running now for, uh, uh, as a campaigner uh, to uh, enter the elections in next year. He's completely free to pursue his political activities, but he's still represented as a human rights defender being persecuted by the Nicaraguan government. So these are the places to come to if you want the truth about these events. And um, we'll hear some more, I think, in a moment in more detail from Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that uh, very enlightening presentation. Now we'll turn it over to Stephen Sefton, uh, who will cover uh, the interviews that he recently did uh, with, I believe, 30 different people, well, 23, 23 interviews with 30 people. So, Stephen, please welcome Stephen Sefton. Hi, um, can you hear me? Can people see the screen? Can, can people see the slides? Yes. Hello? You can. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me um, to participate in this activity. And um, thank you to John for your excellent presentation of the context. I want to look at things both from further away and from much closer up. So um, to start off with, I, I think that when, when we're dealing with people like Medardo Mayrena and Francisco Ramirez, I think we have to put them in the overall global context of the way the United States is consistently using or organized crime um, as, as part of its uh, regime. 
industry uh, participates in effect laundering the crimes of US proxies around the world. And so in the case of Nicaragua, we're looking particularly, of course, at the events of the failed coup attempt in 2018. Um, and I'll, I'll just do a brief of my, 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 the interviews that uh, we were able to do with victims of opposition to violence um, in uh, central Nicaragua. So then, um, when people talk about the human rights, rights industry, what is the human rights industry? Well, an industry requires investors and so, uh, many corporations that invest in human, the human rights industry. You need producers in order to produce a product and there they are, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, a whole slew of academics, activists around the world. And what is their product? Their product is reports, academic publications, articles, and social media material. And they need a market. Where do they market their product? product? They market their product among international institutions, uh, like those of the UN, the Organization of American States, the European Union, among politicians, uh, among media of all kinds, and of course, among the general public. That's their market. Now, when you look at that, I mean, when, when you think about this and for me the key event over the last decade has been the attack on Libya in which completely phony human rights reports led to um, a, a case in the International Criminal Court and that was one of the reasons why it was so desperately disappointing that Argentina a, a few days ago um, uh, although it withdrew its position subsequently actually voted in the UN Human Rights Council um, for a motion for, uh, against Venezuela. And that is not just a media event. That can be turned into an institutional, uh, an international legal institutional process um, attacking Venezuela. And of course, the same applies to Nicaragua. So it's very, very important that uh, we understand the mechanisms of the human rights industry. So then, Human rights industry and organized crime. Well, what is organized crime? Organized crime has a whole series of activities and a whole series of characteristics. But what is of particular interest to us um, in this particular context, Nicaragua 2018, is uh, the, the, the crime of extortion. Stephen, we can't hear you. We lost you. Hello, Stephen, we lost you a moment ago. Private people trafficking. Um, Property crimes. Can, 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 can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Steven? Uh, can you hear me now? You're, you're cutting out a bit, so Hello? I suggest just uh, slow down. Can you, hear me, can, you, can you hear me? Okay. My suggestion is you're cutting out a little bit, so if you slow your speech down slightly, I think it might help uh, us hear all of the words. Okay? Oh dear. Okay, sorry. Okay. So, can you hear me now, Barbara? Yes. Uh, Barbara, there's also a, there's also a suggestion that perhaps if you cut oh, off. Barbara, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I'm trying to uh, stop the video. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me, I'm, I'm sorry for that glitch. So, so 
what I was saying was that in terms of the human rights industry, the particular uh, characteristic of organized crime that applies to the human rights industry is the way they launder the proceeds. They launder the crimes of uh, the, the criminal organizations, in this case in, in Nicaragua. And John gave a very, very good example of that in his um, remarks on Madara Mayrena and Francisco Ramirez. So then, in the case of Nicaragua, hang on a minute. Uh, Stephen, we, we've lost the sound again. Are you speaking? Stephen, can you hear us? Okay. Stephen, are you there? Are you are you there speaking? Yes, uh, I and Nan, I like your suggestion. Let's go with that. Put uh, put Stephen's presentation up on the screen, and perhaps John can say a, a bit more. We can then see if we try to get Stephen back. Do I come in, Barbara? Yes. It, um, I think Stephen is um, is uh, beginning by talking about the human rights industry and the way that the um, the way that the human rights in international industry is linked with the local industry of the the three main human rights, so-called human rights organisations. Uh, that exist in the country, one of one of which was um, actually established by the US during the Contra War to um, whitewash the activities of the Contra in the 1980s and is still an organization which continues today. And all of these um, organizations receive finance from abroad, particularly from the US. Um, I don't think I'll try and talk to Stephen's slides, but perhaps I can just, um, till we get him back, try to summarize some of the um, work that he did in, um, in central Nicaragua over the, the past few weeks. I think all of us have been concerned that, um, that you can see some of the, the people he interviewed in those, in those photographs. All of us have been concerned that uh, there are a lot of victims of uh, opposition crime, and particularly um, crime organized by uh, Medaro Marena and Francisca Ramirez in central Nicaragua, whose voices simply aren't heard. In central Nicaragua, whose voices simply Stephen, can you come back now? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Can people hear me? Can people yes. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so, okay, so I'm sorry for that um, glitch. Um, so can we go back a couple of slides so I can catch the thread of my, uh, back a bit more, back a bit more. Okay, there. So the, um, the, the in the case of Nicaragua, I'm, 
John, John's already talked a bit about uh, Nicaragua. It's the most successful country in the region in terms of improvements for people over the last 10 years. Um, but its achievements have been made invisible. And one of the reasons that its achievements have been um, uh, excluded from uh, mainstream and much alternative media news is uh, so as to prepare the ground for phony human rights organizations. Because the human rights accusations that were made in 2018 um, would hardly be credible in, in the context of Nicaragua's incredible achievements on behalf of its people. Now, in, in, ter in geographical terms, there are two main vulnerable regions, the Northeast and the Southeast. They're both former Contra strongholds back in the 1980s. They both have a, a strong opposition political presence. Um, the Liberal Constitutional Party, the PLSC, um, in, in, especially in the southern, the southeast area, and Yatama and the PLC in the northern, northeast area. And, and as, I, as I was trying to explain earlier on, um, basically what the, the, the Western human rights uh, organizations are doing in, in Nicaragua's case is launder crimes by the US proxies, in particular in this case, people like Francisca Ramirez and Medardo Mairena. Can we move down a bit? So then uh, one, a good example of the way the human industry works is that there was a, a, a panel on June 12th this year, an academic panel. Now in an academic panel, you'd expect both sides to be represented, right? Well, you'd be wrong. Um, in the case, what we're talking about is, you know, one of the most prestigious universities in the world, Harvard University, um, their, their car centre, their car human rights centre. And um, uh, one of their professors, a woman called Erica Chinaworth, organised this panel. And um, among the people taking part were a guy who is the general manager of Nicaragua's, what they called Nicaragua's leading quality independent journalism outlet, Confidencial, which is a USAID funded outlet. And they, they're, they're treating that as an independent journalism outlet. And it's, uh, it's run by a guy called Carlos Fernando Chamorro, who's a member of the oligarch Chamorro oligarch family. And he's been funded by USAID since at least 2008. So you're talking about uh, what is essentially something similar to Voice of America, being touted by Harvard University as an independent journalism outlet. And on that panel too were Amaya Coppen Zamora, who's uh, 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 described as a political prisoner. Now, uh, um, Amaya Coppens um, was sentenced to uh, so, uh, some time in jail um, on the basis of witness testimony by five people who's, who, who she, she, she and her gang robbed and beat up. So, it, I, I, and, and here she is being presented as some kind of human rights activist. Then you have an, another run-of-the-mill assistant professor, Mateo Harkin Chamorro. And then you have this interesting character, Monica Lopez Baltadano. She's the daughter of former Comandante, Sandinista Comandante Monica Baltadano. And she's been absolutely key in coaching people like Francisco Ramirez and Medardo Mairena to, um, to, to project themselves more effectively at an international level. Now, Mark uh, has worked closely with them, and she also works closely with um, the right-wing Radio Corporacion, which is owned by former presidential candidate uh, Fabio Gadea. So now we have, if you look at Eva Amaya Coppins, uh, in April 20th, she was accused of overseeing, or sorry, she was accused once she was uh, arrested of overseeing an April 20th in Leon, a gang that unlawfully detained and assaulted three police officers, beating them with steel tubes, right? So this is this, this human rights activist that Harvard University uh, uh, have invited to talk about human rights in Nicaragua. And she was also convicted by two other people, um, nothing to do with the police, who uh, had a gang robbed and beat up. And they, they were doing that to various people between April 20th and the end of June. But those are the witnesses that figured in her trial. So it's completely untrue to suggest that she's some kind of political prisoner. And, and, and perhaps we can talk later on about the contradiction uh, between the 
uh, Inter-American Court of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights saying that they didn't look at opposition crimes because those were common crimes. And then once the, the, the Nicaraguan authorities prosecuted people as common criminals, they then turned around and said that they were political prisoners. But we, maybe we can talk about that later. So then you have these two characters, Francisco Ramirez and Medardo Mayrena, and they, they're projected, as John has explained to us uh, very graphically, um, with uh, material from Western human rights organizations. They're presented to us as human rights defenders, when in fact, um, as, as we'll see from the testimony of uh, over 30 people. Uh, can, can we move down, Barbara? Can we move down? So here you have the testimonies of six people, William Sirius, Janet Fernandez and her daughter, um, Juan Alberto, Haida, and um, Claudia. And they were all victims of relatively low level crime. I and mean, William Sirius was badly beaten up. He was beaten with metal tubes. Uh, and that beating, in, uh, the, where he was being beaten up, Medardo Mairena was present. And his testimony is that Medardo Mairena was present where he was being beaten up. Janet Fernandez and her daughter testified that, they, that when their house was attacked by gangs from the local roadblock in Quigalpa, the gangs shouted, uh, we're from uh, Medardo Mairena and, and the Movimiento Campesino. We're, and they, they actually shouted that as they were attacking Janet and her family. So, and, and in the case of um, uh, Jose, uh, sorry, Juan Alberto Rodriguez and Heide and Claudia, um, Juan Alberto's family was kidnapped. They wanted to kidnap him, but they couldn't get hold of him. So they kidnapped his family, including a pair of two-year-old twins. And they took them to the roadblock where they, the, 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 the gang was operating in Wigalpa and only handed them over after an appeal by um, uh, officials from the local municipal authority. Heda Kandrai was also um, uh, detained. He was in Nueva Guinea. He was detained and beaten up. Um, and and he, the only reason he managed to uh, escape was because uh, somebody that, who knew that he was he did a lot of good community work, interceded for him with the, the gang that was holding him. Claudia Garcia, uh, her, she had her house nearly burned down when she was uh, w with her elderly parents that were in it, also from the gang, uh, the same gang that attacked Juan Alberto, Janet and William Sirius. Can we move down? And so all these people's testimony uh, implicates and it, it, I, I, I used to, I, in all these interviews, I said to people, well, how do you know that it was Francisca Maria, Ramirez and Medardo Mairena that organized this? And they said, well, they, were, they, they said it, that the people that were attacking us told us. And in William Sirius's case, Mairena was actually present when he was being beaten up. And here we have Maria Mercedes Otado and the, her daughter, Heidi, um, their, their son, who uh, Hades holding the, the portrait of uh, Maria, uh, Maria Mercedes, it's like, I put Mars in Mercedes, it's Maria Mercedes. Um, so he, he was, he was uh, the only dead when the police were clearing the roadblock in a place called Lovico Junction, which is one of the key roadblocks detaining traffic um, uh, during the, during the um, failed coup attempt. Johnny Ruiz's father, Teodoro, was a, an, an, a, one of the most notorious cases because um, he, he, he was a well-known local uh, farmer, uh, much loved, and uh, he, was, he was murdered on the say-so of an a wounded opposition activist who claimed falsely that Teodoro had uh, shot at him, and that was a complete lie, but that was enough for his colleagues to attack, or, or accomplices rather, to attack uh, Johnny's father, Teodoro, and machete him to death, almost severing his head. So then the three guys, and, and, and again, I asked Johnny, well, how do you know? How do you know it was Medardo Mireno? And how do you know these people were organized by Francisco Ramirez? And he said, well, all the information that we have available indicates that they were the people that were organizing that roadblock. And when it came to negotiating to, to, to receive his dad's body, Medardo Mairena put the condition that they'd only release the body uh, if 
uh, another opposition character was released by the police. And if they didn't get, if that condition wasn't satisfied, they were going to burn the coffin and, and, and Johnny's father in it um, and not, and not uh, release the body to the family. So, and that's, so that, again, a, a direct implication of Medardo Mirena. So then down below, a bit further below, we have Captain Alvin Gutierrez. He was the officer in charge of the El Corral police station um, that was attacked. Um, um, but they managed very similar, not, not in as great numbers as, as the attack on El Marito. They were attacked by a gang of between uh, 30 and 40 armed opposition activists uh, from uh, the roadblocks in the area around El Corral, which is uh, on the way to Nueva Guinea, between Quigalpa and Nueva Guinea. Atrida was the head of the police station in El Cuapa that was attacked by a gang of between 40 and 50 armed men all who, who, sh who shouted that they, who announced, Movimiento Campesino, we're here, we're going, we, we're going to kill you. And that was what, that was what she testified um, uh, in, her, in, in the interview with her. And Oscar Luna, um, he was the, the, in charge of a, a very remote uh, police post at a place called Puerto Principe. And his authorities actually, his, his, his superiors ordered him to withdraw, ordered him and his men to withdraw and, uh, after nightfall, undercover, so as to avoid a massacre there in um, Puerto Principe. Can we move down? So then, the, the, the reason these the, 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 these four people uh, are, are in the slide, Marta Machota, Beltran, Biron, and um, uh, Milena, they, they actually were not directly involved, um, in their testimony at least, uh, in the uh, attacks in 2018, but they were involved in the attacks uh, in 2014. <clears throat> And the reason that's the reason I put them in, I interviewed them because I wanted to demonstrate that the Movimiento Campesino has been a violent armed organization right from the start. Right from the start, they've been in, using armed violence. Um, there was a very notorious roadblock. And also they, they, they were using, they were using the movement to practice for 2018. In 2014, they mounted a very, uh, 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 Long, long uh, a roadblock that lasted a long time. Um, it was policed by unarmed police officers who did nothing to try and uh, stop the roadblock from blocking traffic until, and this is very interesting for people who've been following the detail, until the Movimiento Campesino people hijacked two fuel tankers and threatened to set them on fire. Now John will John and other people will be will remember this very well. They did that in Hinotepe. They hijacked two fuel tankers and threatened to blow them up next to the police station in Hinotepe. And they also did it in one of the testimonies. Um, Juan Alberto, I think, uh, explains um, that they hijacked a fuel tanker in Puigalpa and were threatening to blow it up. And that is a tactic that they've been tr using since 2014. So it's not new. The violence of these people is not new. Their intimidation is not new. And uh, a, a Biron, Sub Officer Biron, uh, noted that when when finally they did manage to clear the uh, the roadblock, they were then fired on. Um, and uh, three, I think, it was a total of three uh, compañeros suffered gunshot wounds. One of them still has a bullet in his lung because it was in a a place that was too too delicate to operate. So then the other person there in the bottom right hand side is uh, Carla Vanessa and she was um, uh, on uh, guard duty, not really guard duty, she was looking after a cultural event in Aquigalpa. I've forgotten the exact date that she mentioned but it was, um, uh, I, I think it was early in April and uh, she was with a group of unarmed police officers. Francisca Ramirez arrived at the head of a gang of about of over a thousand of uh, Movimiento Campesino accomplices, and they attacked the cultural event. Um, they, they, uh, and, and Carla explains that the, the, they were mostly attacked by uh, stones, 
uh, the heavy stone throwing, um, being beaten with sticks, but there were people firing using firearms. Luckily, no one was hurt with a firearm. Can we, can we move down a bit more? Um, so then these three people, Walter O'Donnell and Wilberto, Walter was a witness to, uh, he, he lived in a house right next door to the school and the uh, infant uh, uh, refectory that was used um, in, in, in the community for uh, the use of the community. But it was taken over by the gang that ran the Lovago Junction blockade. And Walter witnessed the torture and ill treatment of people uh, abducted by the opposition. And Francisco Ramirez was arriving. He was a witness to the fact that Francisco Ramirez arrived to distribute um, food and money and arms and weapons uh, to the people at the roadblock. Walter was a witness to that and a witness to um, the, the presence of Medardo Mairena. Odonel Casco and Wilberto Garcia, both local producers. Odonel has a, a big pineapple uh, farm and also uh, quite a substantial cattle interest. And he explains how the, the, the criminal blockade shut down the economy there. And both he and Wilberto explained that they were constantly, to, in Wilberto's case, he decided to shut down his business because he couldn't continue paying the, um, the, 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 ex, the, the extortion that the gangs operating the roadblocks were asking for his vehicles carrying his product to market for, for, for export. He, could, he just couldn't continue to do that. And so, something similar happened in the case of Dr. Casco. Can we go down a bit? The whole point of the whole well, it was Francisco Ramirez and Medardo Mirena who were organizing uh, all this blockade, all this criminal activity, all this extortion. Now, one thing that's worth coming out of it, um, one of the things that's worth pointing out is that the, um, the, the when I spoke to local police sources, they said that they reckoned that all the roadblocks in the area were probably generating. On, uh, depending on from one day to the next, but they were probably generating an average of fifty thousand dollars in illicit income um, to the people who were operating all the roadblocks. And as John showed in his in his um, graphic about the roadblocks that were uh, operated by Francisco Ramirez, you're talking about dozens and dozens of roadblocks. So I, I find that figure completely credible, especially when various people commented that one cattle truck would have to pay um, around $400 in order to get through a blockade, or they'd have to uh, drop off one or two of the beasts that they were trying to take to market in order to pay the amount that the um, blockade was trying to extort. So here, sorry, I, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to, I'm speaking quickly because I, I'm conscious of time. So here we have the, the survivors of the massacre in El Morito, um, Javier Antonio, Ana Cecilia, Eva, Yorleni and Jose, and all of them um, suffered, uh, they, were, they were very badly beaten uh, physically. But what struck me tremendously was their their psychological resilience in refusing. And imagine if, that, if they saw their four comrades shot dead like dogs by the, the 200 opposition gunmen. And I asked Jose, were they all armed? And he said, every single one of them was armed. That was his, his response. And, and the, 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 I don't want to... I, the, Talk, talk about their testimony because that's all available in, in the in the PDF that um, Alliance for Global Justice has very kindly hosted on their site. Um, but but and in 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 general, and they 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 confirm what John was saying that the only reason that they survived was because the people at the roadblock had somebody that they wanted to do an exchange for, and they so they, they, these. The, it was a total of nine police officers, in fact, um, who were, were managed to survive because they were exchanged for this police officer. But yeah, and you, you have to read their accounts to see what how, how badly they were treated. And in, in the case of Everett, 
it's amazing that he survived because he got a very severe blow to his head that caused him severe loss of blood. Um, and it, I, he, he, I, I'm surprised that he managed to survive given the fact that he would not, even though he was wounded, he was still being beaten up after he'd been taken to the Lovago Junction. Can we go down a bit? So here we have the brave relatives and partners of the police officers who were murdered. Um, Pedro Oliva Salinas is the, the, the brother of, um, I, I, I've forgotten the name of the guy now, uh, the, uh, one of the police officers who was killed. Claudia Alanis is the mother. Um, Myra is, the, um, is the, the widow of Claudia's son. Sorry, no, we're talking about two different people. Uh, Cla Claudia and Pedro uh, are, are the relatives of one police officer, and Myra and Salvadora. Um, Myra is the, the, the widowed partner, and Salvador is the mother of another police officer who was murdered. One of the striking things about, uh, and Juana Bravo is, is, is the widowed partner of the police commissioner, Luis Emilio Bustos, who was shot dead by um, the opposition gangs in El Morito. But one, one, of, one of the things about Salvador, and, she, and she, she's a very strongly religious woman, but what I found in the case of all the people that I interviewed was their remarkable human quality and a, a very little bitterness. And, 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 and I, I, I have to be careful what I say, and obviously they're, they're, they're very deeply affected by it, but they, they all said, all of them said, the, the most important thing is that the sacrifice has been made and for the sake of peace and stability in our country. And, 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 and they, they were all very proud of that. They were all very proud that, they, that they, they, they've been able to kind of assimilate the amnesty. And, and, it's, and I, I can't imagine how they do it. I'd be extremely embittered. But all, all, all the people that I spoke to had this tremendous quality of, um, of, of, of forgiveness. Um, so, I'm, uh, I've, I've lost, I've lost the, I've lost the, the um, presentation. Um, can we go back to the presentation? Sorry. I mean, if we can't go back to the yeah. presentation, I've probably already taken up my time. But I mean, the, 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 the important thing, the important thing to bear in mind is that this is not an accident. And the fact that the Harvard University uh, people, two and a half years on, are still portraying these individuals as human rights defenders, and they're still refusing uh, categorically to include uh, a, a point of view uh, that supports a different version. Now, I don't think this is a question of interpretation. I think, I, I, I think they're just being completely dishonest. Okay, thanks, Barbara. I shut up. Stephen, thank you for uh, that presentation. I'm sorry that we had so much trouble with the sound, but uh, thank goodness you were able to talk about it later on. Uh, so far, I have pulled two questions. It looks like there may be a third here. So I'll ask the first one of uh, whoever on the panel would like to answer this. Uh, this is from Aaron Kelly, uh, who says, if there is further US-backed violence and or attempts to disrupt the democratic elections, how well equipped are the people to de defend themselves and their sovereignty? I'm thinking of how Cuba and Venezuela have that kind of grassroots defense in place unlike Bolivia, for example. Uh, I know constitutionally the army cannot intervene in civil matters, but are there communal defense organizations in support of the community-based police and the state? Okay, that's the first question. Shall I come in first, Barbara? Whoever would like to. Okay, well, I, I, I think, um, those of us who know Nicaragua well know that the Nicaraguan people are very resilient. Um, and I think that although, you know, they're facing the most powerful 
uh, country in the world. In some ways, um, Nicaraguan people are just very proud of the fact that they're going to stick to their guns and, um, and defend what they've got. And I think that applies even to people who aren't Sandinista. You know, there are the, the, the proportion of the population that is are hard Sandinista supporters is probably a bit under a half. But 80% um, of, the, of the population, when asked in interviews, say that they reject interference by the United States. And of course, we have a very important, two very important factors uh, on our side as well, uh, or they have on their side. One is that the police force was set up by the Sandinistas when the National Guard was disbanded in 1979. And the other is that the army was also set up by the Sandinistas. So um, unlike countries like Bolivia and Ecuador, uh, we don't have this problem of an old fashioned police force or army that are, that are used to paying allegiance to the oligarchy. Uh, that doesn't exist here. And fortunately, it's a, a very important factor. <clears throat> Would anybody else like to speak to that question? Okay, if not, then we'll move on to the next question. Hi, um, hi, hi Barbara, can, can I just add a comment? Yes. Can I ahead. add a comment? Yes. Um, sorry, and I'd, I'd just like to point out that one of the things, and I don't think it matters very much what we think, and uh, as John points out, and the, the Nicaraguans, uh, have a very strong uh, sense of their their institutions, but one one of the things that struck me for, that Juan Alberto said, uh, one of the guys I interviewed, he's an ex-soldier, and he said that we were all ready to have a go, but because Daniel told us not to, we didn't, and and that and I, I think that's very telling. There's tremendous discipline among the Sandinista base. And uh, I think that one of the things that the opposition are probably very aware of is that they won't be allowed to get away with it again. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, uh, next we have a double question from Julie Wettersley. Um, okay, so I'm gonna ask both parts, both questions from her. Uh, prior to the 2018 events, Francisca Ramirez and Medardo uh, Marina have been known to oppose the canal project, supposedly on behalf of the local campesino population who would be subject to displacement if the canal were built. How real and popular is their movement? Francisca Ramirez denied to me in the public event in Washington having received any U.S. funding. What is the evidence that she and Mayrena received such funding? Uh, I think that's the first question. I think I will stop there. Okay, go ahead. Do you want to lead on that? And do you want to do that, John, or shall I? <laughs> yeah, sure. No, I'm Francisco Ramirez, and she's well known in the region and among all the people that I spoke to as being a not insubstantial landowner, and she's got something between three, her, her, either her directly or her and her family. And remember that her husband is an ex-contra commandante um, from the days when Arde was, the Arde Contra group was based in uh, Costa Rica. Um, and so uh, the, the, he, he, he and, and bet, between Francisca and, and this guy, her husband, and they're, they're, they're supposed to have between three and 400 uh, manzanas of land. I think a Nicaraguan manzana of land is equal to something over uh, a, a, a British acre. I know, um, and so that's, uh, you're probably talking about something around 500 to 600 acres, something like that, of land. So she, she can hardly be described as uh, an impoverished campesino. And she, the police records in Guigalpa, uh, Oh, sorry, in the, uh, yeah, in the Oh, no, in Moody Guinea. The police record in Moody Guinea have her uh, uh, and her family as the owners of two large cattle trucks, the very expensive vehicles, and also a very expensive um, SUV, a Toyota Land Cruiser, 
So no, yeah, and she's not an impoverished campesino. Um, and so, so the, uh, what, what level of support does she have? I asked people in the area and they put it between two, 2,000 and 2,500 uh, core members of the Movimento Campesino and they're able to uh, mobilize a few thousand more because they, they pay people and you're talking about very, very impoverished communities. So if somebody comes along and says, well, would you like 100 Cordobas a day to, to go and, and uh, take part in this activity? Well, they'll probably take it. And that's one of the reasons that they, they're able to turn out a lot more people. And also the testimonies that we found, and one of the testimonies that I wasn't able to talk about was that of Santos Reyes Romero, who, whose son was killed by the Movimento Campesino goons um, in, uh, in the area to the east of Puerto Principe on the municipal border between uh, Bluefields and Nueva Guinea. Um, and uh, they, they, they were forced to abandon their land. Why? Because they refused to uh, do what the Movimento Campesino activists wanted, namely take part in the roadblocks. They, 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 the, the, the Movimento Campesino activists were going around trying to intimidate people into taking part in roadblocks, saying things like, Oh, well, you wouldn't want your house to burn down, would you? No, and that, and that, that, that kind of uh, organized crime intimidation, and that's why I insist that the Movimiento Campesino is a, 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 an organized crime structure. Um, so then, have they received money from the United States? Well, uh, the local Sandinista journalist, William Grigsby, got hold of some internal USAID documents um, about a month ago, I think it was, maybe a little more, um, and that indicated that the Movimiento Campesino had received uh, something over half a million dollars just in the period 2017 to 2018. So, uh, but they're completely opaque about their money, and that's one of the reasons why they have internal division at the moment, because the, the, the grassroots are sick and tired of their leadership hogging the money and not explaining how much money arrives and what it's spent on. So just to give an idea of how representative is the Movimiento Campesino, so let, let's, let's assume for argument's sake that the 2,000 to 2,500 core membership figure is reasonably accurate. Put that against the, the total national membership of the Association of uh, Rural Workers, the ATC, their national membership is 47,000. Right, and if you look at the number of cooperatives that are um, operating in the country, most of them are, 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 are rural uh, agricultural or livestock cooperatives. You're talking about a total of uh, 533,000 people that are in the cooperative movement. The great majority of them are, are people involved in rural cooperatives, um, and not one of them is from the Movimiento Campesino. So, I mean, how representative is, is the Movimiento Campesino? Well, it's not. And if you look at this, the actual figures for the number of people that might be displaced uh, by any uh, future uh, canal project, you're talking about a total of something like 320 families. That was what the, um, the uh, e economic and social impact study by environment, the London-based environment, environmental resource management company uh, uh, stated. 320 families, something between 25 and 30,000 people might be displaced by the canal if it ever goes ahead. So, and if you look at the, the testimony of Santos, um, Santos Romero Reyes and his family, they make very clear that they are, they, they are one of many families and, and Santos is very clear about that in the interview, the uh, suffering intimidation, why? Because the Movimento Campesino activists want to get hold of their land, cheap. So they intimidate people into either abandoning their land, which is what Santos did, um, or uh, leaving and selling it cheap. So they can then take it over. And if there is any eventual canal, um, the Movimento ca ca Campesino uh, leadership will be in control of the land and will be able to negotiate juicy compensation. So, and that's that that that's my perspective on the questions that um, 
Julie asked. Uh, Stephen, I think that last point that you made is uh, pretty crucial. Uh, that that explains a lot to me about uh, some of the economic reasons behind uh, some of the activity going on. Um, I see that we're out of time. We've reached um, you know, our hour and 15 minutes. And I know I'm, I personally am willing to go on, but I don't know how further we're allowed to, number one. And perhaps some, some people may not be able to stay who are in the audience, but um, I'm willing to stay if others are. What's your pleasure? Okay. Maybe okay. five more minutes. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you to everyone who has attended, and uh, we will ask a couple more questions here before um, adjourning. Okay. One is and we have several now, so we probably won't get to every single one. But one question is: Are there direct ties between the current opposition? and the former Guardia of Chimosa and the later Contra. One for you, Stephen, I think. We can't hear you, Stephen. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, so very, very much so. And uh, the, as I said, the, um, the uh, people in the Movimiento Campesino, Medardo Mairena is a, a PLC, a Constitutional Liberal Party councillor, he was, um, uh, on the uh, Southern Autonomous Region uh, Autonomous Council. And um, the, the guy that is um, Francisco Ramirez's husband, as I said, he's an ex-contra, um, both he... And um, Francisco Ramirez, a long-standing or well long-standing activist of Turing, which municipality. Um, and so, and what my, when, when discussed, talking about the experiences of the people with the people that we interviewed, um, well over thirty people, um, they they all made I, practically all of them made a direct connection between their experiences of 2018 and um, the experience, the, 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 the war against the government in the 1980s. And, 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 and so, in, and, and that was particularly the case in, in Nueva Guinea when I was talking to people. So. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm, com I'm going to combine two questions. So yeah, and, and, and I think there is a, a direct question from um. Okay, the the trials and tribulations of Zoom, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to combine the last two questions uh, and see if if that works. Um, okay, so part one is what can we do about individuals and organizations who in spite of con incontrovertible evidence, continue to believe the lies and misinformation perpetrated by Amnesty and others like them. Part two, Chenoweth or Chenoweth is revered as some sort of saint and specialist in nonviolence. What can we do about that? So I deal with the, the first one, Barbara. Um, I, I wish I had an answer. I mean, we, we did our report last year, uh, the one called Dismissing the Truth, which I showed in the slides, uh, answering the second of the Amnesty reports. And we tried to get Amnesty to consider that report uh, and they refused. We, we, tr we submitted it through their formal complaints process. We tried to ask for meetings with them. Uh, we tried in a number of different ways. And the NSC in London, which is where Amnesty has their headquarters, tried to arrange meetings and nothing happened. So there's been absolutely no response, even though we showed that much of their report was faced, based on completely false evidence. The same applies with Human Rights Watch. We've had, I, I've made fewer attempts with Human Rights Watch, but I have attempted to engage with their Nicaragua desk, and it's impossible to engage with them. They just refuse to, to have anything to do with us. We, in the case of um, the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, we've made a formal complaint about some of their work, 
and we've recently, uh, Alliance for Global Change for Justice, recently uh, submitted a complaint about their operations to the auditor of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, and we've had no response to that. And so this is a problem with these bodies. They're, they, they, they claim to be open to public um, opinion and claim to be um, uh, you know, open um, to, uh, to, uh, to global justice, I suppose, but they're very closed operations and they won't respond to criticism um, because they're really an industry, I guess. So I'm not sure what the answer is, but we've certainly made attempts to do it to, to get them to change their views. Also, we have with the media. Well, about Chenoweth, I have, I really there have no idea. But because our time is almost over, I want to make sure everyone realizes that Stephen's book uh, that has been published on the Alliance for Global Justice website, which are these interviews, they're really amazing uh, interviews. And I hope you'll take the time to, to read some of this book. It's free, it's online. And thank you so much for being with us today. Can I, can I just yes. can I just comment quickly on Erica Chenoweth? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, my, you see, I, my, my approach, I, I, there's always been a class-based approach, and I pass on for being so persistent. He has the, the, the he's a the patience of a saint. Um. I, my class analysis is that people like Chenoweth and the people that run these, the human rights industry um, have a class interest in not acknowledging the truth. It is not in their interest to be intellectually honest. Right? And so I, I, I think that all we can do um, in answer to the question is insist in as many forums as possible on presenting the evidence and challenging dishonest people like Chenoweth about why they exclude the other side. And it's a bit like, I, I was looking, looking at a marvelous video about Julian Assange uh, yesterday. And the, but nobody, nobody, nobody knows what's happening to Julian Assange in, in effect, outside a very small group of people. Nobody knows what's happening in Nicaragua outside a very small group of people. What we have to do is not give these people the benefit of the doubt. They're not honest. Well, I think at this point we should conclude. Uh, we've run 10 minutes over, but I think it was worth it, well worth it. And uh, thank you to all the panelists and thank you to the audience also for your participation and for hanging in there with us. And thanks very much for your presentations. I think I learned a lot. I believe others did as well. Good night to everyone. Thanks a million, Barbara. Thanks, Nan. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.